Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks so much for attending our webinar. Um, and yeah, thank you again to the Public Health Agency of Canada for, for hosting us. Before we get into discussing youth engagement and the youth STI testing campaigns we've run over the last three years, we wanted to share a bit about our organization, Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights. We came to be after the 2014 amalgamation of three organizations with over 50 years of history in the field of sexual health and rights. These organizations were the Canadian Federation for Sexual Health, formerly the Planned Parenthood Federation of Canada, Action Canada for Population and Development, and Canadians for Choice. Action Canada works to promote and advance sexual and reproductive health and rights, both nationally and globally. And one of the ways we do this is through our health promotion campaigns, including the social marketing youth STI testing campaigns we'll chat more about today. We are incredibly grateful for the funding to carry out this campaign work from the Public Health Agency of Canada's Community Action Fund. When we were presented with the opportunity to come and share learnings from our youth STI testing campaigns, we felt it wouldn't make sense to share the work of these campaigns without involving our National Youth Advisory Board, or what we say as NIAB for short. Action Canada's National Youth Advisory Board was created four years ago with the support of PHAC funding to help guide the content development of four youth STI testing campaigns that were to take place in different regions of Canada over five years. With 13 members from the regions where we launched the campaign, so the Greater Toronto Area, Saskatoon and Calgary, the NIAB have done an incredible job um, helping to shape each campaign. Action Canada is not a youth-led organization, and so we wanted to ensure that we were applying the principle of nothing for us without us. So basically, if we were speaking about youth in our health promotion campaigns, we wanted the campaign direction and content to be informed by the youth from the regions and identities who we wanted to reach. To effectively do this, we sought out youth who, are, who were already engaged in sexual and reproductive health and rights, or SRHR work to join the NIAB. At each significant campaign moment, the NIAB has helped us determine the trajectory of the campaign and input into campaign strategy and creative decision making, as well as the evaluation of each iteration of the campaign. And you can see on the slide, um, those are some of the members of our National Youth Advisory Board, um, some of whom will, you'll be hearing from a bit later. We also engaged youth in each region by hosting focus groups. So for the focus groups, we recruited youth who are not necessarily involved in SRHR in the same way that the NIAB members are. We do this to get a sense of what youth who are from the communities we're trying to reach, but not necessarily involved in SRHR work, think and identify as barriers and motivators to testing. So while the NIAB guide the direction of the campaign content, we all, meaning the NIAB and Action Canada staff, take the information provided directly from youth on the ground to help us test our assumptions about what campaign content, messaging, and strategy will actually land with the youth we're trying to reach. To this end, you'll hear us using the acronym STI a lot rather than STBBI, as STI was the most commonly used and understood and understood terminology expressed by the communities of youth we thought we sought to reach. Checking our assumptions as sexual health experts and champions is a big part of the nothing for us without us guiding principle of youth engagement. Nothing for us without us is about centering youth knowledge and is a cornerstone of youth engagement. At Action Canada, we strive to ensure that collaborations with young people happen in meaningful, reciprocal, and integrative ways. This includes compensating youth for their time, labor, and expertise. Youth engagement is also guided by the assumption that youth are the experts of their own lives and experiences. For projects that directly affect the lives of young people, meaningful youth engagement is key to ensuring that youth are valued, that they have an investment in the outcomes, and that the project remains relevant to the people it is meant to serve. 
It is for all of these reasons that we thought it only made sense to hear directly from some of our National Youth Advisory Board members themselves about the STI testing campaign development, youth engagement, lessons learned, some of the key challenges we encountered and how we moved through those challenges together. So with this being said, we'll start with some introductions and meet today's other facilitators. I'll pass it over to Tapaza now, who's one of our, um, who's one of our incredible NIAB members. Hi everyone, my name is Tapaza Yu and my pronouns are she, her, or the they. I'm currently in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is the Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. And now I'll pass it back to Makeda to introduce my fellow board member, Destiny Now. So uh, as Sarah mentioned at the beginning, um, due to some unforeseen life events, Destiny couldn't attend this webinar live. However, I will introduce them as they wanted to be introduced here. And then we will be playing an audio recording of Jessany reading her parts later on in the webinar. So this is Jessany's introduction. Hi everyone, I am Jessany Lee. My pronouns are she and they. I'm from Toronto, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I'll pass it on to Makeda now. Hi, I'm Makeda, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm the Health Promotion and Education Officer at Action Canada. I work with our National Youth Advisory Board, some of whom you just met, to develop campaign content relevant to youth. I'm joining you all from the West Coast on the unceded land of the Lekwungen speaking peoples where the Esquimalt, Songhees, and Wasonic nations have and continue to live today. And my name is Britt Neron, and I use they them pronouns and I'm the health promotion officer at Action Canada for sexual health and rights. I work um, several days a week on our sexual health information line answering questions and providing support for those who are seeking sexual health care and information. I'm joining today's call from Ottawa on unceded Algonquin territory. Action Canada team members live, work and organize on the unceded and unsurrendered territories of First Nation, Inuit and Métis peoples. We feel that it's vital to center our work towards reproductive justice and reconciliation and decolonization. That includes holding governments to their treaty obligations, ensuring settlers continue to, to strive towards understanding and resisting the deep and ongoing history of institutional reproductive and sexual violence against Indigenous peoples. This also means recognizing that Indigenous communities have long been leading on human rights. One of the reasons why we acknowledge the Indigenous land that we're physically located on is to become engaged in an ongoing process of learning about our relationships to colonialism. Learning about the diversity of Indigenous nations and territories that have existed since time immemorial and continue to exist on what we now call Canada is a first step in situating ourselves within social, economic and political histories that continue to impact our experiences of and access to sexual health. We encourage you all to visit nativeland.ca to learn more about the Indigenous territories that you live in, the Indigenous names of these lands, and the people and nations within them. If this is the first time that you're hearing about this website, or if you were never taught the names of these Indigenous nations or territories before, we encourage you to continue your learning journey and investigate why this may have been the case. So now we'll be providing a short overview of the project thus far. So before we hear from the National Youth Advisory Board on the specifics of the GTA and Saskatoon campaigns, we'll set the context by describing the project a little bit more, um, which is a multi-year social marketing campaign to increase STI testing rates. This project has been broken down into one national campaign and three regional campaigns. The national campaign aimed to reach youth across Canada between the ages of 16 and 24, while region, each regional campaign seeks to address a specific segment of the youth population in a specific region. On the slides, you'll see a breakdown of the project by each year. So year one entailed the research and planning, securing partnerships and recruiting and onboarding the National Youth Advisory Board. Year two saw a national campaign for youth across Canada being carried out. Year three was a GTA-based campaign for racialized newcomer, immigrant and refugee youth. Year four, which we're just wrapping up, was a Saskatoon campaign for 2S LGBTQIA plus youth. And current, we're currently we're in the planning and research stages of our year five Calgary campaign for GBMSM youth or gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. 
which includes queer, two-spirit, trans men, trans mask folks, and non-binary youth. So what does the project entail? For each regional iteration of the campaign, we not only have built youth engagement into the foundation of each campaign from the beginning, but we've also worked closely with partners on the ground in order to create tailored campaigns that speak to the regional complexities and population specific differences in knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, and structural barriers. We knew it was vital that as a national organization setting out to cre create re regional campaigns, that we deepened partnerships with regional organizations doing sexual health promotion and service provision work. Our regional partners are, are really the experts on the regional gaps and specificities, on trends in STI testing and transmission, and also carry significant knowledge pertaining to the types of health promotion interventions that work well with their specific regional audiences. For each regional campaign, existing partnerships with specific associate, associate organizations in our network were deepened and strengthened, particularly with those organizations working with the priority populations and within the regions we were seeking to reach. This also meant being mindful of the capacity of our partners, both in general and in, term of the pan in terms of the pandemic's impact on our sector's collective capacity. This also meant ensuring that our interventions fit neatly into the work they're already doing on the ground to avoid mismatched information or sexual health guidance that could create more confusion rather than clarity. We're deeply grateful for all the time, expertise, and camaraderie of the partners that we have engaged with and are currently engaging with on these campaigns. On this note, we want to send our deepest thanks and appreciations to our partners at Planned Parenthood Toronto, Access Alliance, Saskatoon Sexual Health, Out Saskatoon, and the Centre for Sexuality in Calgary. Additionally, we are grateful to our partners at Point Blank Creative, Cathexis, and Akendi, who supported us in the creative evaluation and research components of our campaigns. Each campaign has involved a research component, which has included focus groups with the youth communities that we're seeking to reach, a creative component to design the materials used to create behavior change and plan their strategic dissemination, and an evaluation component to measure the extent of both reach and impact of each campaign. As Makeda previously mentioned, youth engagement is at the heart of every campaign that we've run. By taking an approach to youth engagement that involved youth sexual health experts as content advisors in the form of the National Youth Advisory Board, as well as a more general population of youth, the focus group participants, as content generators, we were able to wrestle with the National Youth Advisory Board and our local organizational partners about creative tensions that came up about what we wanted and what would actually work with each audience to help make testing a more normal, less stigmatized part of routine healthcare. Jessany and Topaza will go more into these creative decisions, but some of the overarching issues that surfaced were tensions between tone and language to avoid stigmatizing and gendered stereotypes, while also be, being more reflective of the kinds of conversations that might be had and how youth actually talk about and view testing. Diverse racial and language representation, but also not wanting to stigmatize communities of color by linking STIs with a, cer a certain community. Diversity and inclusion versus stigmatization and tokenization. So it was really important for youth to see themselves reflected in the multitude of their identities, but we also recognize that in our pursuit for diversity, we run the risk of tokenization and what focus group participants in Saskatoon talked about as kind of an unrelatable forced diversity. And lastly, another tension that came up was questions of how to ethically visually represent identity. For example, uh, and newcomer communities have a lot of diversity within them. And while we wanted to show people with differing abilities and a wide range of gender and sexual orientations, sometimes it was arbitrary and limiting to say, this is what someone who's queer looks like, for example, or this is what someone who identifies as disabled looks like. So I've been using this word social marketing. So I wanted to take some time to define that for those who are unfamiliar. Some of you might be wondering, what is it and how can we use it to create behavioral change? In terms of its definition, social marketing is the use of strategic advertising techniques to promote behaviors or ideas for social change. It's fundamentally different from awareness raising campaigns, which typically seek to build up awareness and knowledge among the intended audience, but not necessarily change behavior. Social marketing campaigns raise awareness as a first step, but in a way that is intended to translate in this knowledge into action and change. In the STI testing campaigns that we've run, 
It involves the use of online-based advertising and information sharing to, to demystify the STI testing process, motivate individuals to seek testing, and provide all the information that they need to do so. For instance, a directory of youth-friendly testing locations that they can use to find their nearest clinic. We use the IMB or Information Motivation Behavior Model to inform our work. So I'm just gonna break down that model a little bit further. Information means that the target audience has the information and knowledge required for the desired behavior. In the case of our campaigns, that means that the target audience has the information they need around the importance of STI testing, what STI testing looks and feels like, how to access STI testing, what questions they'll be asked, how to advocate for themselves if they don't receive youth-friendly care, what confidentiality, what confidentiality looks like, etc. This information is tailored for each specific audience that we're hoping to reach, acknowledging that every audience might have different knowledge or informational needs. For the motivation part of the IMB model, this means that the target audience feels motivated to perform the desired behavior, which is in this case getting tested. In the case of our campaigns, this required first developing a solid understanding of the barriers and motivators experienced by those we were trying to reach through a set of focus groups with individuals of each specific audience. Many focus group participants expressed that they were anxious about what to expect when it comes to getting tested and whether testing would be uncomfortable or painful. So we provided clear, non-fear-mongering, accessible and concise information on exactly what to expect to help overcome that barrier. It's important to note that many barriers, however, are structural. For example, a lack of youth-friendly services that are available nearby, long wait times due to COVID, um, impacting services, or clinics that were inaccessible without access to a vehicle or perhaps a drive to get there. Our approach to these barriers is two-pronged. It means continuing our adv advocacy and policy level work at Action Canada outside of this campaign to help address and mitigate these barriers, while also ensuring that our campaigns acknowledge these structural contexts and provide youth with strategies to navigate care within these restrictions and confines. That context is especially important in terms of how you are defining the quote unquote problem that you're seeking to address. And we have always worked from the premise that low youth STI testing rates don't mean that youth are apathetic about their health, but that typically it comes down to access to affirming care, accurate information, and the quality of sex ed and so much more. Motivating individuals to access testing also meant moving away from fear and risk-based understandings to routine-driven understandings of STI testing. This move was really grounded in the concept of sex positivity, which situates sex as just a normal part of life for many people and does not place moral, moral value on the different kinds of sex. It centers things like pleasure and consent and moves away from fear and risk-based framings acknowledging that, that these often actually disincentivize or shame folks away from carrying out certain health promoting behaviors while also perpetuating stigma. Since the number one thing that came up in focus groups was that participants typically associated testing with an admission or of irresponsibility or guilt. And since typical tools used to assess frequency of testing mostly focus on risk-based assessments, we wanted to move away from this towards a more neutral and positive framing of STI testing that really delinks it from risk-based assessments, which were seen as confusing at best and stigmatizing at worst, according to focus group participants. In other words, we wanted to move from the concept of get tested only if you've engaged in a behavior deemed risky or irresponsible to get tested regularly as a part of your healthcare routine. The exact messaging varied from get tested at least once a year to find the right testing fit for you based on the communities we were seeking to reach, but centered on the concept that STI testing is something that all sexually active folks can do to proactively care for their health and that of their partners. In other words, testing is no longer a sign of irresponsibility or risk-taking behavior and just a neutral, normal way that we can care for ourselves and our partners. And lastly, for the behavior part of the IMB model, this means that the target audience has the behavioral skills necessary to perform the, perform the behavior. <laughs> For our campaigns, this means that our target audience knows how to follow through. They know who to call, how to make an appointment, what to ask for, and if relevant, how to communicate in their relationships about the importance of testing or advocate for the importance of testing. It also means following through on the behavior. For our campaigns, while it's difficult to access provincial testing data and show attribution to our campaigns, since our campaigns are regional in scale, 
but also due to provincial differences in data collection and differences in reportable versus non-reportable STBBIs. We use self-reported intention to test as a proxy while also bolstering this data with any trends noted by clinical partners in each region. For example, whether they noticed a visible increase of youth in the specific audiences coming in to get tested while our campaigns were active. And now I'll pass it over to Makeda to chat briefly about how the COVID-19 context informed and, and changed how we carried out our campaigns. Thanks so much, Britt. So it's worth noting that while we've just outlined the general structure and strategy behind running these cross-country social marketing campaigns, even the best laid plans hit snags in the road. Nowhere is this more apparent than the collective pivot that almost every sector in the world, but most notably healthcare sectors, had to make as the COVID-19 pandemic has torn through our communities. As I'm sure is the case for all organizations and individuals present on today's webinar, the pandemic has resulted in many significant changes to how we carried out our campaigns. This result resulted in both logistical changes, including shifting focus groups from in-person to online, as well as strategic changes in order to reach and stay relevant to youth audiences amidst a pandemic. At the onset of the pandemic, we paused briefly to take stock of how access to STI testing would be impacted. While this terrain is still constantly shifting, we feel that it is timely and perhaps more important than ever to emphasize the importance of STI testing for folks who are sexually active, particularly given that many provinces were at epidemic levels of new STBBI infections prior to the pandemic. We are concerned, as I imagine you all are, by the impacts to service delivery as many providers are working at reduced capacity and currently prioritizing those who are symptomatic or, or who have a known exposure to an STI. Our policy work continues to address this, while in the meantime, our campaigns emphasize strategies to access testing within the current context. Even within the context of the pandemic, it is important to keep preventative sexual health care top of mind and we are concerned with long-term impacts of delayed access to care that we're likely to see in the coming years in terms of access to routine screenings like pap tests, STI testing, and other preventative health care. Finally, it still remains to be seen exactly how the pandemic has impacted our sexual activities. Sorry about that. Um, anecdotally, we have seen changed sexual behaviors ranging from folks continuing to find ways to meet and connect to others who have decided to opt out of meeting new partners at this time. To those who are stuck at home without privacy and within potentially unsafe or violent contexts. And also the many changes around desire that can come from living with heightened stress and social economic health insecurities and anxieties. The two campaigns we're featuring today provide a sort of before and after picture of navigating the new context of COVID. I'm gonna now pass it over to Jessany to speak about the GTA campaign that we ran from 2019 to early 2020, prior to COVID hitting Canada. And then Topasa will speak to the Saskatoon campaign that was developed and launched between the first and third wave of the pandemic. We also just wanted to note that while the video concepts we are showing today are in English, as they stem from our campaigns in Saskatoon and the GTA, our national campaign was bilingual and had concepts that were both in French and English. We would be happy to send those over to anyone who's interested. So the next section details our Greater Toronto Area or GTA campaign. This section was written by Jessany Lee and will be delivered by Jessany in the form of an audio recording. For our campaign in the GTA, we were looking to engage youth who identify as racialized immigrants, newcomers, or refugees. While some of us on the NIAP identify along these lines, those of us who are part of the NIAP also have a higher than average knowledge base when it comes to sexual health. Many of us on the NIAP already volunteer or work in sexual health within our communities. So to find out what a broader section of newcomer youth in the GTA 
think and know about SI testing, we held four focus groups in the region and engaged our partners at Planned Parenthood Toronto SNAP program, where I also used to volunteer. Within these focus groups, we learned that many of the main barriers to SI testing were similar to youth across Canada. For instance, lack of knowledge about why SI testing is important and a lack of clarity about what the testing process and tests were common. There was a so a significant lack of knowledge of SAI testing and treatment. This was something that we found to be the case across Canada and many young people we spoke with pointed to negative classroom sex ed experiences. One of the main differences between the newcomers we spoke with in the GTA and the birth youth sample from across Canada was a difference in the perception of family and community consequences if the parents were to find out that they had gotten an SDI test. The vast majority of participants were worried about their families and communities' reaction to getting an SDI and it, what it would mean about being sexually active. Almost all noted that they believed their parents were more socially conservative than other Canadians' parents and there was a general shared cultural belief about not having sex before marriage. Related to this, they also described fears about confidentiality with their family doctor and said that they would be more likely to seek services outside of the community or family practice. But another big concern of this group was the systemic challenges and what focus group participants called unconscious biases like racism in the healthcare system. In a few moments, I'm going to more detail about what we learned in these focus groups and how we applied it to the development of creative concepts. I will now share about the products of our GTA campaign. When creating the content for our SI testing social marketing campaigns, Action Canada and Inaya sought to create content that incorporates the authentic language and expressions of young people, thus speaking to them effectively. We also wanted to ensure that we were meeting young people where they are at, positioning the perspectives and knowledge of young people as the focus of social marketing campaigns is crucial as in such topics as SI testing because the challenges young people face in assessing SI testing are often unique. Such worries as, will my parents find out? What if my parents hold on to my health card for me? Will the clinic still see me? Will the doctor judge me or think I am irresponsible? These worries are particular to young people, so social marketing campaigns that do not directly address these difficulties will not return desired results. Besides, when presenting information on social media, we also have to make our content youth-friendly. For example, we are not afraid to use vibrant colors, music, social media influencers in emojis, but we also listen if youth are telling us that a certain emoji is outdated or a phrase seems like it is trying too hard. Listening to youth is the first and most important step in ensuring that our content has a wide reach on social media and a high rate of actions upon seeing the ad. One of the ways that we listened to youth in the GTA was to change the tagline to get tested for STIs at least once a year because the feedback we received that get tested, which was used in the national campaign, was not enough to convey the clear intent of this campaign. There were three concepts of advertisement in the GTA campaign which included test your SI knowledge, belief, and sexting. Each ad has its own unique purpose and addresses a different set of barriers to SI testing that young people in focus groups identified. When taken together, these concepts work collectively to ensure that information is youth-friendly and relevant to racialized newcomer youth in the GTA. I so show you and discuss these three concepts more. The first one is the relief ad.
The relief art has been the most popular concept across all of our campaigns, so we continue to reuse it and make minor adjustments each time. We think that this ad continues to be so popular across all campaigns because it quickly captures the audience's attention and provides the basic information about what to expect when getting tested. Youth in the focus groups let us know that they liked how they immediately knew what they were going to watch. The ad links to our once a year .ca website where we have added in more information about when testing should happen and what to expect at the clinic. This ad addresses young people's concern around the complicatedness of SI testing by portraying the process as easy with quick shots, chill images, and cool music. With the slogan, just chill and get tested for STIs at least once a year, at the end, the relief ad helps to ease young people's heavy feelings around and demystify the SI testing process to encourage making it a part of regular health routine. But it is worth noting that both Anaya and the focus group had concerns on the ad portraying SI testing to be too easy. Trying to find a balance between a chill portrayal of the process and a still serious emphasis on SI testing, the NIAB had decided that information on the website needed to be very comprehensive. While the tone and music of the ad could be playful, the language and images needed to be clear, concise, and realistic. The second one we have is the sexting ad. The middle concept on the slide is our sexing ad which we will now play It is remarkable in its ability to connect to young people. This app addresses young people's concern around the perceived hassle of SI testing, confidentiality, and normalizing the idea of getting tested at least once a year. While the Relief ad tries to portray SI testing in a quick and simple way, the testing ad sought to personalize the process of SI testing by having two per people discuss their testing experience while being given the necessary information regarding SI testing in its messages. While Denaya wanted to keep these conversations as gender neutral as possible, focus group participants identified that they would be more relatable if at least one conversation had a very clear masculine markers. In the end, we ended up using conversations that came directly from focus group participants. The final concept is test your knowledge concept that Brit will play now. Unlike the other two concepts, the test your SI knowledge ad brings a degree of interactivity to the facts we want to present. It is a single animated video with variants for placement on Instagram stories and on Snapchat. The highlight of this concept is that it seeks to represent various pressure identities visually and provide a lot of knowledge about SI in an accessible, fun way. Thus, not only can the audience interact with the video to test what they know about SES and learn more, but they can also feel honored and seen in a variety of identities portrayed on the video. With this approach, we feel we can improve engagement by playing on the audience's own sense of curiosity and responding to their desire for more information about STIs and SI testing. The audience could pause on various facts and it allows them to absorb reliable information in a space where they are go 
already engaging and so confidentiality is more easily maintained. Receiving multiple pieces of information helps to drive more in-depth interaction with the content. In conclusion, the guest tested for SES at least once a year campaign intentionally adjust individual level barriers to SES testing. It was effectively designed to respond to youth identified need for information about where to go to get youth-friendly health care, including SCI testing. It also addressed barriers, misconceptions, and stigma around SCIs and testing, which denial and youth in focus groups indicated as being partially due to inadequacies in sexual health education. Reflecting on the GTA campaign, it was successful in its attempt to speak to racialized newcomer youth in Toronto authentically. As a newcomer youth in Toronto, I could see myself represented in the test your SI knowledge concept and have my experience well portrayed by the conversation on the 16th ad. For me, the key takeaway about this campaign is the complexity of how we strived to represent identity diversity in our content on social media platforms. Since social media have been moving towards a photo-based content and less word-based content, I was in a mindset to pursue visual diversity as I talked to Denaya, Action Canada staff, and other partners. However, as we tested our content in the focus groups, I learned that despite the trend towards photo-based content, using authentic expressions and language to the identity groups was just as important. As diversity was the focus of the campaign, we also want to reflect on how we achieve diversity in identity representations thanks to various perspectives from the focus groups and the NIA. In the NIA, because of differences among members' backgrounds, we were able to see the issues around sexual health and rights in general and SI testing in particular from various aspects. For example, when Denaya was discussing the barriers to sexual health care in Canada, the lack of knowledge of the accessibility of sexual health care was brought up by me as I was the only international student on the board who did not have a health card and who had just come to Canada for more than a year. As I talked about how the high cost to seek treatment for my health prevented me from actively seeking health care, even though I was covered in the end, Action Canada staff and I, Denaya, recognized that the lack of clarity around the cost of sexual health care could be a significant problem in Toronto's newcomer youth community. Because of this viewpoint on barriers to seeking health, sexual health care from newcomer youth like me, in our test, your, as I knowledge add, we had a photo dedicated to stating that the cost of SI testing was covered. As the Toronto campaign sought to reach Toronto's newcomer youth, having our content recognize that perception of cost could be an obstacle to SI testing was important in speaking to the targeted audience. Another instance is Naya's approach to resolving the tension in the tone of campaign's content. As we transitioned from the national campaign to the Toronto campaign, we had difficulty in trying to find a suitable and balanced tone of campaign's content. We wanted to emphasize that SI testing was no big deal, but since the targeted audience in Toronto comes from diverse backgrounds, we also had to account for the fact that SI testing was still a big deal for this youth and thus find a suitable tone for our ads. The awareness that SI testing could be heavy for the targeted audience in Toronto was brought up thanks to the United members who came from culturally conservative backgrounds. As Action Canada staff and Inaya brainstormed on how to balance the tone of the campaign, I came up with the idea that we could have the best of both worlds by having the language of the sexting as address the perceived severity of SI testing while letting the relief ad adjust the two parts of the SI testing. And I am the Action Canada staff found this solution to effectively balance the tone of the campaign, which was eventually implemented in the Toronto. All of, the, 
all of these key realizations when constructing a campaign would not have been possible had we not had the diversity in backgrounds and thoughts, perspectives, and context supplied by the NIAC and focus groups. Thus, we can see how necessary it is to have diverse representations of identities in youth advising and focus groups because it allows us to have a multitude of perspectives on the matter at hand so that our solution to the problem fully and appropriately addresses the matter. Thank you, Jessany, for sharing about the GTA campaign. And to situate everyone within the Saskatoon campaign, I will first do a high-level overview of the three concepts we developed specifically for this campaign. The first image that you can see is a screenshot of the relief ad, which was shown previously, and it is a video that breaks down the process of testing into a few simple steps. It was created to meet the wants and needs articulated in focus groups for a simple, easy to understand explanation of what to expect in the testing process. And particularly for folks who had never gone to STI test before, this served as a tool for them to gain more transparency of the testing process and also motivate them to get tested. Britt will now play the second ad. STI testing is all about finding the right fit. That means picking a testing location where you're most comfortable, brushing up on what kinds of tests to expect, and getting tested as often as it suits you. STI testing isn't one size fits all. Find the test that's right for you at testforyou.ca. Thank you, Britt. And the second ad, which is referred to as the Right Fit ad. The Right Fit ad was a drag queen concept where we featured a wonderful Ilona earlier. And after gathering consensus on moving forward with that ad that involved a drag queen, we decided to feature Ilona because of her ability to speak to the 2S LGBTQIA plus community and indigenous community as an openly two-spirit and non-binary drag queen. We wanted the tone of this ad to be fun and lighthearted while emphasizing that testing isn't one size fits all. The idea that testing isn't one size fits fits all was demonstrated by Lona changing into different colorful outfits throughout the video, which parallels the idea that the frequency and type of STI test we get is unique to every single individual. Lastly, the third image on the slide is a screenshot of the web tool on the campaign website. The web tool was developed to be a addition to the right, find the right fit concept. The web tool aimed to provide a clear pathway to find out where you could get tested that is queer and trans friendly and how often you should get tested. By providing a list of queer and trans friendly STI testing clinics, the web tool was created to speak to the barriers around fear of being misgendered or other forms of transphobia, homophobia, cis sexism, and heterosexism. Also, we hope that the web tool could alleviate some of the nervousness and anxiety around getting tested by providing a pathway to information and services and equipping use with knowledge before booking an appointment with a clinic. So the reasoning behind why we use this messaging and visuals for the ads was that this campaign's primary goals is to increase STI testing rates among their target audiences. We had four primary objectives that we wanted to achieve. Number one, to increase awareness of STIs. Number two, increase awareness of local, queer, and trans-friendly STI testing services. Number three, provide information on how to get tested and where you can get tested. Last but not least, demystify and destigmatize the STI testing process. With these goals, objectives, and audiences in mind, we decided to rerun the relief ad to speak to those with informational gaps around what testing could look like. And the Find the Right Fit ad with Alona was created to speak to the numerous people in focus groups who noted that they would feel represented and motivated by hearing a famous drag queen speak candidly and openly about getting tested. And this concept normalizes testing while reminding viewers 
that they can access the type of testing that works for them based on their relationships. And finally, the web tool gives a general sense of how frequently folks can get tested based on their numbers of partners and frequency of use of safer sex practices. To provide a general recommendation of how frequently to get tested, this reiterates that frequency of testing is not one size fits all, while also redirecting folks to find their nearest queer and trans-friendly clinic to make an appointment if they do wish to. I'll now speak to the differences between all of the campaigns. After reflecting upon the national and GTA campaign, it was incredibly important for the Saskatoon campaign to be reflective of the feedback given by the focus groups and also lesson learned from the previous campaigns, which led us to develop a more tailored campaign for the Saskatoon audience of 2S LGBTQIA plus youth. We further tailored the Saskatoon campaign to reflect the four major barriers to STI testing that the focus groups identified, which were number one, concern around confidentiality of the results or about receiving testing. And number two, the fear about having to describe the type of sex they were having to a healthcare provider. Number three, the lack of understanding around the process of getting testing, including how regularly to get tested. And lastly, number four, the lack of motivation to get tested. And this is largely due to the lack of understanding of why it is important to get tested and a lack of awareness around the testing process. While well, some of these major barriers were the same as youth we surveyed in the GTA and nationally, notably confidentiality concerns and a lack of knowledge about the STI testing process, there were also some key differences that led us to modify the Saskatoon content. More specifically, we switched from a call to action, which was get tested once a year, as a reminder was based on a routine driven approach to testing, because the main request made in the National and GTA focus group was that it would be helpful if there are a simple testing benchmark that they could refer to if questioned by partners. In moving into the Saskatoon campaign, it became very clear that focus group participants had a higher level of comfort with talking about testing, which created space for a more personalized approach. This new call to action is finding the individual test that's right for you. And this find right test, right fit messaging about, delivered by a famous drag queen was ultimately viewed as a more motivating for queer and trans youth to seek for testing. And while focus group participants had a higher comfort level around talking about testing, this didn't necessarily mean that they had a higher knowledge level. And specifically, they were concerned about several barriers. One of the barriers they experienced was the challenge they encountered going to a clinic for the very first time. After all, they didn't know what to expect. They also felt like they should know more about the procedure, which poses another additional barrier for them to ask questions because they were afraid of being seen as unprepared or worried about being stigmatized for their gender identities, sexualities, relationships, and sexual activities. We moved forward with the creative concepts for the Saskatoon campaign, which were reflective of this call to action. And these reflections are demonstrated by ensuring that queer and trans youths knew that STI testing is about finding the right fit for you and your experiences and that they would be able to access healthcare providers who are 2S LGBTQIA plus friendly and youth friendly. And available, available and an idea of how often to get tested before even going into a clinic. It is also important to acknowledge that COVID-19 has impacted everyone in different ways and it has created more barriers for youths to access sexual health services. And during the creative development process, we were all very cognizant of the possibility of a second wave. We needed to be adapted to the potential barriers that may be imposed on us and the delivery process of the campaign. And this was one of the reasons why we decided to run an entirely digital campaign. We also originally wanted to launch the Saskatoon campaign in fall 2020, but due to the pandemic, we shifted the launch date to January 2021. By targeting a time that was ideally after the second wave, as public health restrictions loosens, 
and people start to reconnect physically, we could reach people at a very critical time. We also needed to be responsive about the possible lockdowns and how the limit on interactions will ultimately lower people's sense of urgency to get tested. The two main tensions we wrestled with when creating the Saskatoon content will be the uncertainty and unknowns about the pandemic and how it would affect the way that we delivered the campaign were barriers we had to adapt to. We had to be cognizant of the potential testing fatigue with the COVID-19 testing messages and if STI testing will fall short on the priority list for folks. We also had to reconsider and strategize the messaging of routine STI testing with clinic capacity, availability of swabs, and the reality of STI testing in the context of COVID-19. The second tension we wrestled with was being diligent in representing queerness respectfully and inclusively, from both highly visible and recognizable to less recognizable expressions. For instance, while most of the focus group participants wanted the ad to show a very over visibly recognizable queerness, some youths in the focus groups and NIAB also flagged that not every queer person see themselves in a flamboyantly queer representation. We also wanted to avoid tokenization and misrepresentation of disability, gender, sexuality, and culture. An intentional stigmatization of linking STIs with a particular community or forced diversity that focus group participants talked about as undesirable. For instance, when seeking to represent two-spirit and indigenous young people who identify as part of the 2S LGBTQIA plus community, this needed to be done in a non-stereotypical, reductive, or stigmatizing way. Forced diversity was a phrase brought to our attention by focus group participants. It refers to content that tries to diversify the representation of identities so much that it loses the focus of its content. In the focus groups, participants identify this problem as seeing so many identities represented, but not sure for what reasons. Hence, when making a digital social marketing campaign targeted at diverse identity groups, we had to ensure that not only our representation of diverse identity groups were authentic, but we also have to know how to balance how diversity and our messages worked out together to reach the final goals that we wanted to. As the Saskatoon campaign concluded and we were able to reflect on the successes and opportunities learned from the campaign, we ultimately thought the Saskatoon campaign was a success and was well received by our identified target audiences. The formal evaluation is still in progress, but from what we heard from queer youths in the region, they were viewing the ads often. Given the circumstances and constraints that the pandemic has presented itself, Ashton Cata staffs and the NIAB were able to adapt well and be flexible with the uncertainties. One of the ways that we did this was having semi-regular campaign meetings amongst all the partners, which included the NIAB, local organizations, and the creative agency. This campaign identified and addressed the gaps and opportunities flagged by the focus groups and created fun, engaging, and youth-friendly content that spoke to queer and trans youths in Saskatoon. As we move forward from the lessons learned from the Saskatoon campaign, and reflect on things that we can carry over to future campaigns. We would be highly interested in exploring other ways of engaging youths and incorporating youth voices in health promotion campaigns that we haven't explored yet. Specifically, we would like to explore the different features on social media platforms that will better speak to youths in their experiences, such as Instagram proling or TikTok clips. This exploration would continue to find new and unique ways to reach even more youth's voices by building off the model of nothing for us without us, as it has allowed us to tailor the campaign to youth in the hope of leaving a positive and long lasting impact on their overall health.
Thanks so much to Paza for that great overview of the Saskatoon campaign. So as the Saskatoon campaign um, concludes and we move into the Calgary campaign, we wanted to speak briefly about some of the impacts um, that we have uh, been able to measure as a result of our campaign. Um, so for the campaign in the GTA, some highlights of the results include each individual in the target demographic seeing the campaign over 13 times. Um, so this number of impressions is really important when it comes to message retention um, of the messages that we're trying to set forth. Um, we saw a 400% increase in the number of visits to our online social service provider directory uh, to find an STI clinic. And a comparison of pre and post campaign surveying noted notable increases in positive attitudes towards testing and the intention to test. Um, so within that, we saw an increase from 45 to 66% among racialized youth in general that felt that getting tested is no big deal after seeing the campaign. An, an even higher increase within the newcomer specific population with of an increase of 38 to 75% of newcomer youth viewing testing as no big deal after seeing the campaign and an increase of 18% of newcomer youth self-reporting the intention to test within the next year, um, which like I explained, we used as a proxy for uh, testing behavior. While we're still in the process of evaluating last year's campaign in Saskatoon, the results are looking equally promising in terms of moving the dial on attitudes around STI testing. We again wanted to thank our partners at the evaluation firm Cathexis for all their support in the evaluation of this campaign. We learned that it was really important to be nimble when it comes to developing an evaluation strategy as different youth communities face different barriers. And as a result, progress must be measured differently when we're all starting from different baselines of attitudes, knowledge, behaviors, and access. I'll now flip it over to Makeda for some final campaign reflections before we move into the Q&A portion of today's chat. Thanks so much, Britt and Topaza. Um, so beyond these hard indicators of campaign success that Britt mentioned, um, we were perhaps even more interested in the more qualitative lessons to come from these campaigns. So some of the biggest qualitative lessons we've learned are around youth engagement, um, and I'll just share some of those with you um, now. So the process of creating these campaigns alongside youth during the COVID-19 pandemic has led us to understand the importance of making space for online social connection during a really isolating time. And within online only youth engagement, we learned that it's best to check in with our youth board and see what levels and type of engagement they prefer most. This might seem obvious, but the simple act of asking and checking your own assumptions about what youth are interested in goes a really long way. And this is especially true during this time that we're living in that's that's all online. So for instance, um, asking them, do they prefer Zoom calls or are they Zoomed out? Um, are Google surveys or document reviews an accessible form of engagement? We, for instance, assumed um, that Google Docs were not going to be the best form of engagement, but for some of the NIA members, this was actually more appealing and accessible, um, especially as Zoom fatigues uh, started to take over more. Um, so something that we learned is having a variety of ways to engage uh, so that you can meet various needs at various times is a really, really useful approach. We also asked ourselves, um, are there other ways to connect online that we haven't considered? And in terms of some of the overarching lessons learned, um, from, from all of this, you must be prepared for not every youth on your board to agree to the best form of engagement, but knowing what, uh, what the youth on your board want is a first step in crafting a strategy that will strike a balance in terms of meeting everyone's needs. So again, the big lesson here is not to make assumptions about what type of engagement would be ideal, and instead to survey, um, ask your youth board members to tell you what they want and need in terms of engagement, communication strategies, and relationship building, and then um, listen to them and, and implement those, those suggestions. Another key uh, related lesson is uh, that we learned is remaining flexible to changing or adapting your strategies as young people's wants and needs change. 
And this is especially relevant during the pandemic when we're in a period of time with little day-to-day uh, -day variability for many of us, um, and yet heightened anxiety about the future. And we know um, from research being done that, that youth are really bearing the brunt of this anxiety as they experience really high levels of social isolation um, and economic insecurity, and then all of the mental health challenges that are coming with that during, during this time that we're living in. A final lesson on youth engagement that was gleaned from asking our youth board members about um, how they wanted to be involved and what they wanted to be involved in was moving youth engagement beyond just uh, this specific project involvement. So many board members identified a desire to be engaged not only in the STI campaign work that we've uh, spent a lot of time talking about today, but in the larger work of, uh, of the organization. So for us, uh, this meant assessing our capacity to support youth engagement in other areas of the work that we're doing um, and ensuring a wider organizational buy-in around the importance of placing youth at the center of, of other work that we're doing at Action Canada. So once this was established as a shared priority, members of the board ended up engaged in many other ways, uh, including speaking at the UN Human Rights Council, which is now all online. So it makes it uh, more accessible for youth to, to be involved in. Um, and then also creating and co-facilitating webinars, webinars, just like this one. Um, the youth board members uh, have also been engaging in Instagram live sessions, uh, speaking on panels of experts from across Canada and the world, um, and participating in sexual and reproductive health awareness week, and also building content for, for that campaign. Um, and we did a webinar about that uh, with, with the Public Health Agency of Canada back in February. Um, and then another way is that uh, uh, being on our board of directors. So we, we have um, one of our youth on this webinar, actually, Topaza, is, is also uh, on our, our board of directors. Finally, something that we did that has been really helpful in organizational wide buy-in is uh, we bolstered our youth engagement that we knew we wanted to do uh, with this specific STI, these these STI testing campaigns with a youth engagement policy, um, which stipulated the philosophy of our approach to youth engagement organization wide. Um, and we can always refer back to that as, as a touchstone. Um, and it also helps us outline important things like rates of compensation. Um, so normalizing that we must pay youth for their time and expertise. And uh, we cannot stress this enough, when, when building youth engagement into any kind of public health work, um, youth do need to be um, paid. We're so, so grateful um, to have had the opportunity to develop these important learnings around youth engagement as a result of this funding opportunity through the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, We're so grateful to have created I had the opportunity to create effective health promotion campaigns alongside youth to compensate youth with honorarium and also to have had the opportunity to share some of these key learnings with with all of you today. This concludes today's presentation but if you're interested in learning more about any phase of our campaign's development um, from youth engagement to creative concepts to evaluation we'd be really happy to connect with you and share all that we've learned um, and help support similar initiatives to take root in, in your communities across Canada. Um, you can reach us at the contact information provided on the screen and we'll now move into questions and just thanks so much again, everyone for, for your time today.